Hi, hello, I am Marta Correa. I am one of the Natural Sciences Director of Studies um, here at Downing College, and I've been doing interviews for, I think, about 11 or 12 years now. So what we're going to do next for the next 15 minutes or so is to have uh, an example of what to expect at an interview. And I have with me uh, Holly, who I believe is going to introduce herself. Uh, hi, I'm a second year um, bio Natsuki. So I've done my first year um, and I also did interviews online. Okay, so um, for the first 15 minutes or so, I will be chatting to Holly to give you an idea of what to expect at your uh, interview. And then we will end with a little bit of feedback so you can get an idea of what it was that I was looking for um, in the interview, what went really well, what else perhaps Holly could have done. So we'll, we'll, we'll find out. Um, so, okay, let's, let's get started. So uh, Holly, thank you for coming. It's really nice to uh, meet you. So I would like to talk to you a little bit about something that was in the news a lot, maybe three or four years ago. So um, uh, Cancer Research UK put out a huge campaign about the second biggest preventable cause of cancer. Do you remember uh, that? No, that's fine. Do you, do you think what it might be? So the second most preventable cause of cancer? Um, maybe something to do with diet or exercise? Yeah, so it was obesity. So I can, uh, I'm going to share my screen with you. Uh, if I can get the technology to work for me. Uh, there we go. So these were just some of the um, sort of posters that were shared at the time. Uh, can you see this okay? Can you see yeah. this? Great. Great. So yeah, so these are just two examples of the posters that were done at the time. And yes, it was it was obesity with uh, smoking being the, uh, the first one. Um, so how do you think this sort of link can be established so if you had to design a study this was very controversial at the time there were a lot of people who were very upset about these sort of claims so obviously they were backed up by by studies so if it was up to you to sort of think about a study how would you go about establishing a link between obesity and cancer um i suppose through um some kind of study having a control population who potentially don't have cancer uh, matched with a um, patient population so a population with cancer um, and then seeing if there are any kind of correlations uh, so i suppose with obesity or um or any other kind of things like smoking uh so potentially using some kind of survey um and trying to make sure that it's in some way a matched control and patient population though obviously not too matched because you want to be able to see correlations so you'd be looking at sort of controlling perhaps other risk factors and then yeah. seeing whether say prevalence or um, progression was was worse in the, in the group that was at any rate so, so yeah all, all good ideas so if i give you um because obviously the, the the link with cancer it wasn't with all types of cancer but i believe it's 13 types of cancer where the, where this link has been established and one of them as you can see on the list there and one of the pretty big um circles is actually breast cancer so mm. if i give you a more specific example and obviously you mentioned correlation a lot but uh, uh yes perhaps correlation is not causation so um yes thinking about that specifically around breast cancer what sort of study do you think um so maybe looking at having people over, tracking people with over their lifetime so as in changes in obesity over lifetime as, as risk as well because i suppose as a way of controlling for genetic factors um so maybe i know breast cancer has got the brac1 um so maybe with people within that population seeing if people who have who are, are more obese have a higher risk of also developing uh, breast cancer um yeah I don't, i'm not sure what else well i'm sure there are other so, so let me show you some data from, from one of these studies so this is just a graph i took from one of the one of the papers um suggesting let's say suggesting for now a link between obesity and cancer so i'm going to give you just a few moments to to, to look through this and then when you're ready let me know and we'll have a chat about what's to be shown here mm -hmm. Okay, I think I'm, I think I've taken okay, it. So what do you think are the sort of main take home messages, main findings? Uh, well, there's especially a like correlation, I suppose, the key part, not necessarily causation um, between the obese individuals with both luminal A and luminal B like cancer um, have both got the 
like the fastest decreasing survival probability over time. Um, so that's suggesting that they are at a higher risk of um, kind of dying as a result of having this cancer um, with, with their obesity. Um, though interestingly, the luminal A overweight is actually more likely to survive for longer than the luminal A normal weight. So that maybe suggests something to do with you know, obesity not being a completely linear correlation. Um, but yeah, that's what I would su suggest it's showing. Yeah, so absolutely. This this isn't saying that uh, obesity or suggesting obesity is everything. We're also not seeing any sort of error bars, right? So it mm. may be, yeah. I, I completely get your point that those two lines are rather close. Uh, but yes, with, with error bars, it's possible that they're actually overlapping a lot. And yeah. Just, they're just missing as much difference. So of all those lines, which do you, which one do you think is sort of most striking uh, in, in suggesting that it, indeed there is a link? Uh, the luminal B obese line, I would think, because it's the greatest decrease in survival probability over time. So, so 60 months, roughly five years, and you've got a much reduced, like 75% chance of survival rather than, I don't know, compared to people who have the same type of cancer, um, but aren't, don't have. Um, yeah, so that's a very good point because these two types of cancers, clearly one of them also has a, yeah. um, a, a, a higher chance of survival compared to the other one, yeah. isn't it? So perhaps one of the very, very striking lines as well is actually the grey one where the luminal A, which clearly has a better chance of survival, goes yeah. under the, the, the chance of survival for, um, uh, for, for luminal B with a normal weight. So mm. that is really kind of making that point or at least yeah. conveying that, that, that message that yes, if, if for overweight participants, participants patients, mm. um, they, their, their chances of poor outcomes um, increase so much that even a type of cancer that is clearly less harmful mm. than the other will become comparable. Yeah. Um, okay, great. So all of these things we've been talking about, uh, I think are really, really getting the message in for correlation. Mm, yes. Are we there for causation, do you think? Not necessarily. There could be quite a few compounding factors which haven't been controlled for. So, you know, we don't know if the people who are obese maybe also have a higher higher proportion of them maybe also smoke or take part in, you know, lower levels of exercise. It's not necessarily a complete, it's not, it's a correlation, but not only is it just a correlation, it's also a not completely controlled. Um, yeah, we don't know. We don't have the full information. We don't know which other factors it's controlled. Yeah, yeah but, but absolutely. So I'll, I'll just stop share because we don't need this anymore. Yeah. But uh, just sticking to this for the final few minutes, mm. um, what do you think we'd have to do to establish causation? Ooh. For causation, I suppose, well, in some ways it's beneficial or not beneficial. You can show causation through a mechanism. So if there's some way of mechanistically saying that, you know, directly through obesity, maybe there's some kind of something happens in blood levels or something I'm not sure but there's yeah. something else that happens that can be directly linked to um progressing tumor growth or making cancer more likely to be um like spread um so yeah you want to have a mechanism um you can't just use correlation absolutely right so yes we can show correlation as much as we like but without a mechanism it could always be because something else that we haven't thought about that is actually linking the two things um, okay, so how do we prove uh, causation? Um, maybe we can think about a candidate. We, we were talking about breast cancer. Hmm. Um, do you know much about what uh, what causes breast cancer? What, what are the sort of uh, um, high risks? I know that there's some genetic causes, definitely with like the I think I BRAC BRAC one, um, but I I'm not. I know there are also quite a few different types of breast cancer, uh, yes, and yeah. I think they differ slightly with their causes. Um, so I think apart from genetic factors, I'm not overly sure what different types lead to breast cancer. Fine, so let me give you some information, mm -hmm. okay? Uh, so some of, the, some of the very early studies established a link between the um, uh, percentage of fat, so the, the, the body weight, and production of estrogen, particularly post-menopause. So it is, mm -hmm. it is um, thought that after menopause, the fat cells effectively increase the production of estrogen in the body. Okay. Uh, does that help thinking about? Yes, so I suppose in terms of uh, estrogen production, potentially increasing risk of 
breast cancer or um, I suppose also that links into why people given the pill also have somewhat a somewhat higher risk of cancer um, so yeah estrogen production maybe right. so increasing mm. estrogen levels yeah. actually it will increase the, the rate of cell division yeah exactly um, the rate of division in the breast yeah. Does. particularly in breast and ovaries actually all yeah. the reproductive system mm. is, is, is affected by it. yeah uh, so yeah so we've got candidate mechanism so mm. very final thing how would you go about designing a study designing a study to prove causation with this um, that we've identified potentially using a model organism so something like a rat um, okay. that maybe has a similar hormonal control system to humans so for example if we're thinking about estrogen you would want to make sure that there is either a very similar or the same hormone controlling, um, for example, female um, reproductive uh, physiology, I suppose, uh, and then maybe injecting um, estrogen or or having a artificially creating a higher level of estrogen um, in some candidates over others and seeing if they have a higher likelihood of developing tumours. Yeah, uh, absolutely. And you talked about model mechanism. Why wouldn't you do this in humans? Because it's unethical <laughs> yeah, sure. one, one. Yeah, it is and unethical. also well. because uh the generation time span so Absolutely. you want to yeah. see over a long period of time especially some cancers are if it's in, uh, involved with postmenopause, um you'd have to wait for a really long time to see if there are any effects um and then it would be hard to get any kind of statistical power um or limit you have less statistical power yeah. okay great i think that's uh everything for me Thank you very much. Thank you. So how did you find that, Holly? Yeah, it was good. I think it was very reminiscent of what I, the parts I remember of my old interview. So um, kind of having it being quite a fluid discussion based on what you can kind of give back based on a question um, and how the question kind of keeps going deeper based on one topic. Um, but yeah. It was interesting being back in the back in the hot seat. <laughs> yes, this time you get to find out what I thought about it. She <laughs> didn't do your first interview. Uh, so yes, I, I agree. I think it was a really good discussion um, because it was very, very much a two-way discussion. So obviously I was asking you questions, but you were giving me information back and you didn't always necessarily know about the issue a lot, but it doesn't really matter as long as you kind of give me something that allows us to continue having a conversation and for me to then uh, give you more information that allows us to progress through through the question. So obviously there are there were some certain things, certain keywords that I was hoping you'd bring up. So things like correlation versus causation, or uh, that point about a mechanism, identifying a mechanism being essential for, um, uh, for to prove uh, causation. And and yes, also obviously mentioning an animal model rather than suggesting we could do those sorts of things in humans. All of those things were, were things I was hoping would come up. But again, if you hadn't mentioned them explicitly, I had a few extra kind of uh, hints to, to, to give you to hopefully guide you um, guide you towards those sort of conclusions. So yeah, I think it was really good. This is the sort of thing we're, we're hoping for in, to see in an interview. Um, and also, uh, you can tell me whether I'm right or wrong, Holly, but also trying to stim sort of simulate the, the supervision environment mm -hmm. where obviously it's not a one way form of learning where the supervisor will sort of ask you questions and then give you some more guided information. And it's, yeah, it's about, it's a conversation, um, I think. So yeah, I say this a lot to uh, potential applicants. Actually, it's a two way interview because uh, you're also interviewing us to see whether the supervision system suits you or not. Uh, I don't know if anyone ever believes me, but uh, yeah, I think it's actually a really, really good way of interview, uh, finding out for both the applicant and us as a, this particular person would do well in supervision environment. Yeah, I would agree with that. <laughs> okay, great. Well, thank you very much, Holly. Thank you. <laughs>